probably for me, you know, I would say that was, uh, you know, probably the most fun that I ever had in the uh, the video game business over the last, uh, you know, uh, 15 to 20 years, um, because it was that sense of, you know, absolute freedom and the sense that, you know, you could, uh, uh, you know, just do whatever you want. Um, the uh, way that we did things in those days was um, purely people often said to me well did you have a MIDI sequencer well no there was no MIDI sequencers do you have a tracker no there was no trackers what did you use so uh, the answer to that question is that we all just used purely an assembler and uh, we you know coded everything up in an assembler and uh, well how did you edit the music well what I used to do was um, load up a machine code monitor and I would uh, literally you know display the bytes in real time and uh, you know the thing the music was all working on the in, on the uh, you know triggered on the raster interrupt and so I would uh, start changing the numbers in real time to alter the uh, you know the uh, synth settings and to alter you know musical notes and things and so you know I would tend to work like in I would tend to work on like four bar chunks that I would get to repeat, let these four bars play, and I would just sit on that hex editor, you know, monitoring the numbers and uh, changing things, you know, like 3C hex would be a C, 48 hex would be a C, 30 would be a C, and I used to know these numbers backwards, you know, and uh, if the high bit was set, that would be an indication of. Uh, like a patch change or something like that and um, I would sit and tweak all those numbers until I had the four bars you know pretty much the way that um, I wanted them to sound and then that would let me then continue on you know uh, and expand for another 16 bars or something like that um, the uh, A few other strange things happened in the 80s, you know, where uh, I can tell you a few a few stories that happened, you know. Um, the, uh, like, commando story is interesting because a guy calls me up at, uh, like, you know, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon and says, um, the guy from Elite Systems calls me up and says, uh, I've booked you a train ticket to come down from Newcastle to Birmingham. Can you be on the train? I says, no, I, I'm dead busy, you know. He says, I'm desperate. I need, like, some sound for this game. And so I've, I've booked you a ticket. Can you be on it? I says, well, you know, how much are you going to pay us, you know? So he quotes a figure, and I said, okay, I'll do it for that. And uh, so I gets on a train at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I get down in Birmingham about half past 5. And then I, you know, he takes me to the pub. <laughs> And then we eventually goes back to the office about eight o'clock, and uh, this is to, this is for the commando game, and I, I starts working on the commando thing, and then everybody goes home. I'm left in the office on my own, you know, um, and I have like uh, you know the game music and a high score, and then I got to do look at the game and do all these get a list of all the sound effects and do all this stuff. Anyway, I. Um, I worked through the night and got all the sound effects done and then uh, I finished at about 8 o'clock in the morning and uh, there was like, you know, these, th there was these rows of these uh, uh, like, uh, you know, benches where the people had all these C64s and so what I did was, uh, <laughs> before everybody came in, I loaded the music up on every one of these C64s and had it, I turned it up as loud as I could. And when everybody came in, came in, you know, there was just this absolute cacophony of uh, all these machines playing the commando music, you know. And then I got on a train and went home and started working on something else. So <laughs> that was uh, that was the kind of thing that used to happen in those days. Um, um, another one of the other things that happened was. Uh, we, you know, we were always, you know, looking for ways to, uh, 
try to find something that the machine could do that it really wasn't designed to do. You know, like you look, used to look in the manual on the C64 and it would say things like, you know, you look at the diagram, it say X, oh, you know, don't use this bit, you know, it doesn't, it's a don't care bit, uh, and there'd be a little note saying, you know, don't set this bit, whatever you do. Of course, we'd say, okay, I don't care, I'm going to try setting the bit and see if it does anything, you know. And um, we, uh, we were always looking for ways to try to squeeze more out of this thing uh, by, you know, doing things in assembler and tweaking around. And uh, I remember um, I was I had to do this uh, this game, and the, I called the guy up and I said, "So, you know, what kind of music do you want for this?" You know, and the guy was stoned out of his brain. I could tell that he'd been, you know, s smoking some stuff. And uh, he said, oh, I just want some Hendrix, man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I uh, thought, okay, well, I can't really do, uh, you know, do justice to uh, the famous Jimi Hendrix. So, but I did put a, I did a heav this heavy rock tune with a sample guitar thing in it, you know, and. Uh, that was that was about as close as I could get to doing Hendrix, so we um, we did try to uh, do things with like four-bit sample sounds and things like that to try to get some squeeze some more things out of it. You know, I uh, I remember when we were doing that stuff with sample sound, it was um, The sample sounds were being triggered on the non-maskable interrupt, you know, and uh, what you would do is you would get the foreground and the raster interrupt doing your main routine and getting the non-maskable interrupt doing the sample sound, and you would, you would, you know, you would, what, what happened was you would just keep tweaking the register on the non -mask, the speed of the non-maskable interrupt until the whole thing just died, because at that point there was no more CPU left to do anything, so, okay. That's, that's how you found out what rate you could actually try to get a sample out of that thing. Um, the most I ever did on the C64 was uh, two sample channels, and um, which was like two bit, uh, two bit audio or something like that mixed together. Um, that was the most I ever did on it, uh, but it was it, at that point it was getting really painful. Um, to do uh, squeeze anything more out of it. Um, uh, one of the uh, other things that I did in the 80s, I, know I, I did other things besides the C64. I used to uh, do 8-bit um, Atari. If anybody remembers the 8-bit Atari, that was quite a screaming box uh, CPU-wise. And uh, there was also um, Atari ST Amiga there was a thing called the Einstein Tatung, which was, uh, there was also the MSX machines. And uh, there was uh, uh, this awful thing called the Sinclair Spectrum, <laughs> if anybody remembers that. And then there was this other thing called an Amstrad. Amstrad 60, uh, was a 64K, and then there was an Amstrad 128, um, which was another absolute dog of a machine. but. Um, at that time, I used to do uh, ports as well. But what I did was I uh, I developed a system so that my uh, well, she was my girlfriend at the time. She became my wife. She, you know, she would uh, be able to understand enough about the about the uh, the data format that I used on a C64 to be able to get all this stuff across to these other machines. So you know. Um, I used to get her to do all that stuff for us um, because I was still also playing gigs with a band as well at that time. And uh, I used to have this room set up with these, like a, it was like a kind of a U-shaped type of thing like that. And I had 11 machines surrounded by us at that point, you know. So I had like two C64s, a couple of Ataris, a, an ST. I was one of the first people to buy an Amiga. I paid. Uh, one thousand pound for my Amiga, just because uh, of all the hype and the press and everything about the Amiga, and 
the um, it was a little bit painful to program the Amiga in those days as well.